the guy who was appointed uh, on the Federal Reserve Board, the original Federal Reserve Board, Wilson appointed, had all sorts of big shots, and it goes from Paul Warburg, who was soon lower than all sorts of other people. But the guy who really ran the system from 1914 until he died in 1928 uh, was a guy named Benjamin Strong. And everybody admits that when he ran the system, he seized power. As head of the Federal Reserve Board in New York, he was in control of all the bond operations in Wall Street, which was the key to this whole thing. He ran it with an iron hand for about, let's say, until he died. Uh, so who was Benjamin Strong? Well, most historians don't look into it. They, they say what he did. He's very inflationary. He, he doubled the money supply with, during the war, thereby financing the war, basically, uh, American participation in the war. He kept inflating during the 1920s to support England's uh, crazy bond system, which I hope to get to before it comes over, a crazy monetary system. And uh, thereby was responsible for the Great Depression, because he kept inflating during the 20s, and the reaction came in 29. So he's a lot to answer for, Strong. And the question is, who was he? The question which, which somebody like myself would ask, okay, Strong was very powerful. He ran the whole system. Who the hell was he? Where did he come from? What was he before he was been head of the Fed, really running the Fed? Well, he was his vice president and then president of Bankers Trust Company. Bankers Trust Company, as we've seen, was, was a, Morgan, a J.P. Morgan institution, which, which was created around 1901 or so in order to buy trust instruments, which is a new instrument then, trusts are, and trade and trust instruments. Trusts are very important there. They set up a trust. A trust is a high-powered, protected or, uh, instrument. In other words, uh, the government can't invade trust very well. If you set up a trust, it's protected from a lot of government intrusion. So at any rate, uh, the Bankers Trust Company is a Morgan institution. Benjamin Strong was a disciple of Henry P. Davison, is a best friend of Henry, Henry P. Davison, Morgan partner. He lived in Englewood, New Jersey, which in those days was a very wealthy suburb. Uh, lived right next door to um, Davison, I think. And his other close friends were Thomas W. Lamont, Morgan Partner, and Dwight Morrow, Morgan Partner. His three best, best friends in the world were mentors. I guess I think Davison was a mentor anyway. His three best friends and mentors were all partners of J.P. Morgan and Company. He joined the country club very swanky country club they all join, et cetera, et cetera. When he gets, he gets the nod, Colonel House, of course, being a Morgan person, is running, manipulating the, all of Wilson's appointments. He gets the nod, the offer of being head of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. He doesn't want to take it. He feels unworthy, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, gee, I'm not really, I'm only a president of Bankers Trust. He was persuaded to take it by Davison, Lamont, and Morrow. No, no, you got to take it. We need you, blah, blah, blah. And he, and he takes it. In other words, Benjamin Strong lived his entire life in the Morgan, the J.P. Morgan ambit, very close as a top Morgan person. His policies after he got into office were totally consonant with Morganism. In other words, he, he followed J.P. Morgan's basic policies, uh, which I will now get to. Now brings us to World War I. J.P. Morgan empire was getting into economic trouble. Remember, Morgan was heavily involved in, in railroads, and always had been. Railroads are beginning to collapse. From 1900 on, begins the long secular decline of railroad industry. And J.P. Morgan, even though they're into industry too, was lying behind Kuhn Loeb when it got to underwriting and being investment bankers for industry. Kuhn Loeb is a jump, it's like with all monopolies or quasi monopolies, they're, they can't, they don't spot the, the new trends coming in very well. And so Morgan didn't spot the industry trend. He lagged behind Kuhn Loeb. Kuhn Loeb was doing better. In 1914, Morgan's very important New Haven Railroad, a $400 million railroad, went bankrupt. And we began to see then the right, handwriting on the wall, the Morgan Empire might totally collapse. It might be a total destruction for, for the Morgan, the vast Morgan Empire. When World War I comes, happily for Morgan, we have World War I. Uh, uh, J.P. Morgan always had tremendous, very close ties with the Bank of England and the English finance, English and international bankers. And as soon as the war was declared in August 1914, Henry P. Davison, Morgan partner, gets on the boat, gets on the ship, I guess they call it. There's no plane, of course, no Concorde. <laughs> <laughs> no jet. He gets on a ship, rushes to London, and makes a deal with the Bank of England and the English government. Uh, J.P. Morgan and Company got the total monopoly of all underwriting of, of British and French government bonds in the United States. Unbelievable situation. In other words, the British and French are going heavily into debt in order to finance the war effort. The United States is expected to buy most of the bonds, and the Americans are supposed to, expected to buy most of the bonds. J.P. Morgan and Company gets the total monopoly of underwriting. And all the big commissions which is involved. Monopoly of underwriting British and French government bonds, which they then happily began to float. In addition to that, 
It so happened that most of the war equipment, most of the war industry, which America now began to ship to Britain and France, especially Britain, uh, steel and all that sort of stuff, were essentially Morgan companies, U.S. Steel, Bethlehem, uh, various arms equipment firms and Morgan companies. So here we have J.P. Morgan Company very heavily invested now in the victory of the, of the French and British in World War I, and in, uh, both, both because of the government bond underwriting and because of the war equipment underwriting of the, of the, of the war exports. Very heavily involved. It, pulled the, it essentially pulled the Morgans out of a financial depression, but now Morgan, the Morgan Empire is now totally committed to the importance of British and French victories. The Germans had won the war, uh, the entire Morgan Empire would have collapsed because the bonds would have been worth, worth, worthless and all the rest of it, the war equipment industry, et cetera, et cetera. So the Morgan began, as a matter of fact, J.P. Morgan at the very beginning, as soon as the war started, uh, J.P. says, he said it later to, I think, in a congressional, congressional investigation, he said, from the very big start, we did, and we mean his Morgan Empire, we did everything we could to contribute to the cause of the Allies. In other words, everything we could to drag the United States into the war on the side of Britain and France. It becomes a Morgan project. And the entire Morgan statesmen, so to speak, get involved in this thing, using all their influence on, on Woodrow Wilson to get him into the war, including Colonel House, who was lying to Wilson constantly in order to try to get him into the war. Ambassador Page, Ambassador to London, who was conniving with the British Secret Service and with the British Foreign Office, and with, uh, and with uh, House, Drag Wilson into the war. Wilson's sort of a dumb dumb in this thing. You know, it's not that he's unwilling, but he's sort of a little bit reluctant. And uh, <clears throat> the Morgans used their only powerful influence to try to do this. Uh, as, uh, as Secretary of Treasury McAdoo said, it was, of course, again, a Morgan person totally, totally wrapped up with Morgan. Our prosperity is dependent upon our continued and enlarged foreign trade. To preserve that, we must do everything we can to assist our customers to buy, to maintain our prosperity, and we, we must finance it. Well, what the hell does that mean? It means that we, what do you mean we have to finance it? What he's saying is the basis of the foreign aid program, which still exists now in huge quantities, that for our export industries to be prosperous, quote unquote, the American taxpayer, okay, in other words, look at the situation here. Here's export industries. In those days, Morgan controlled. Because they're not getting too many, too much business, we, the American taxpayer, have to be have to be taxed. The money has to be shipped abroad to Paris, to Britain, France, Angola, you know, whatever it happens to be, whatever dictatorship or whatever is involved. And then these these dictators then buy American exports. They use the dollar to buy American exports. So our prosperity is financed financed by our foreign aid. What is this? Who's the our? Who's the we and who's the our? It's very much like the the Keynesian nonsense about we. The national public debt is good, the national debt is good, so we only owe it to ourselves. The question is, who's the we and who's the ourselves? The we, <laughs> the ourselves here, is the, is the Morgan interest. In other words, the taxpayers are being financed. At each step of the way, taxpayers have, are socked. The American taxpayer pays through the nose for whose benefit. First of all, the American government takes its handling charge. In other words, the bureaucrats get some money out of this. They get their salary. So some of the foreign aid gets siphoned off the U.S. government. The rest of it gets sent to Britain, France, Zaire, you name it. You underline Pakistan, whoever it happens to be. They get their cut. They build up their bureaucracy, dictatorship, whatever it is. And they take the rest of the dollars and buy American exports. U.S. Steel, General Electric, whatever it happens to be. So in other words, the whole foreign aid process uh, is a process by which the American taxpayer is suckered into subsidizing American export companies and plus other bureaucrats, American bureaucrats and foreign bureaucrats. And so Morgan and Morgan partners are leading the way in, in war propaganda. Uh, they set up an aerial patrol. There was an aerial patrol, aerial coast patrol in 1915. The war starts in 1914. In 1915, Henry P. Davis and Morgan partner, the guy who made a deal with the Bank of England, probably one of the most important people in the 20th century in America, almost unknown now, Henry P. Davis, a key figure. So he, he sets up the aerial coast patrol to get, and Baruch is in this and so forth, to get Americans to look for German planes. And they, they, sit, they stand there on the, on the rooftop in New York or somewhere. They get the design of what a German plane looks like. They're looking to spot German planes. Oh, I've got nonsense. No German planes. And they're looking. It, it induces this war hysteria on the part of the public. And they're out there on the roof looking for German planes. Yeah, yeah, that's a German plane. So uh, creating a, a sort of a war, a war climate. Uh, Charles Schwab, the head of Bethlehem Steel, Producing armor plate. Hey, we got a great armor plate thing. And he sets up a propaganda to have a big navy. You need a big navy. 
Navy, Navy ships, U.S. Navy ships, then, of course, using armor plate. Who are they going to buy the armor plate from? Bethlehem Steel, of course. So you have these guys, these munitions manufacturers, and Morgan setting up uh, war, war propaganda agencies. The Plattsburgh, New York, way up state, New York uses a post-trade universal military training zone. These guys set up a camp to, to have the draft and prepare the way for conscription, which was, which was really probably unconstitutional. The Morgans led this thing. For example, in the Aerial Coast Patrol and the Plattsburgh, it's called the Businessman's Training Camp. All these Morgan types are up there training and getting everybody else to come in and, and, and military training. Who was running it? Willard Strait, Morgan partner, also the publisher of New Republic. Uh, Robert Bacon, Morgan partner. Teddy Roosevelt, Morgan tool. Henry Cabot Lodge, Morgan person. Ella Hugh Root, Morgan lawyer. These guys, and they, by 1915, they're pushing for a declaration of war against Germany. Maybe it took, it took a very short period of time. Original pro-war types. Um, DuPont was a big arms manufacturer, of course, all in favor of heavy munitions spending. Uh, and all the rest of it. The, uh, as Morgan, Morgan again said, we agree that we should do all that was legal, lawfully in our power to help the Allies win the war as soon as possible. This is 1915, 1914. Uh, the, uh, how did, why did war break out? In order to, because I, I want to talk about this, because it's really the beginning of all, as I said last time, it's the beginning of all foreign policy. All foreign policy to this day rests on the whole World War I experience, so to speak. What you really had, the real problem was that Germany and Russia had a sort of a cozy alliance for a long time. Neither would attack the other. They're both, the Tsar and the Kaiser were cousins, part of the same German family. And so uh, the peace of Europe continued for quite a while. But then, what then happens is the, um, the Russians, Russia gets taken over by um, hopped up Tsarist fanatics who are, who are essentially generals and pan-Slavic types. I believe it was a holy Russian the Holy Russian uh, mission in life to, to run the, you know, to all the Slavic peoples. Everybody, anybody who's a, a Slav is destined by God to be run by the Russian Tsar. So, uh, which, so this, this, this inspired a perpetual drive by Russia to take over the Balkans and, and any, any place which has Slavs in it. Uh, the German part of Poland, the Balkans, where the Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungarian Empire was in bad shape. They had a multi-ethnic kind of situation. Uh, and the Russians began to rely with the Kingdom of Serbia, which was a uh, group of hopped up Serbs that wanted to take over all the Serbs in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, living in Croatia, Bosnia, and other places in Eastern Europe. So we had, in other words, a Russia, a Russian, first of all, Russia was the most imperialist power on the continent for most of the 19th century, constantly taking over northern uh, Central Asia and so forth, Tashkent, Ghana, as well, a whole, whole bunch of areas in, in, in uh, Central Asia. You had an imperialist Russian drive now to, take, to, go, to move into the Balkans, to take over Turkey, to take over the, the, uh, the Bulgaria, whatever. So this is an, and run this whole, this whole Balkan area, thereby coming into immediate conflict with Austria, Austria and Hungary. Uh, meantime, the French, in their own right, they want to re, re seize Alsace Lorraine, which had been taken over by the Germans in 1871 uh, on the French German border. Uh, this is a complex situation, and basically what happened was that Louis Napoleon, who had been the Emperor of France, uh, went to war against, the Germ against Germany, and, uh, and after being kicked back, after being defeated, the Germans took over Alsace and Lorraine. Now, the, the case for Alsace is pretty strong, I think. Al Alsace is basically German, ethnically German, uh, speaks German. Lorraine, probably the case, is weaker. But at any rate, the result of all this was set up in France a desire for, among all parties for what was known as revanche, or revenge in, in English, but the, the, these are the revanchistes. So we have that, in, in among, especially among the French right, right wing, for 30 years or 40 years, agitation to, to, to go to war against Germany to re, to re, to re seize Alsace Lorraine. Um, France was not very much like because France was, France was a republic and then all the other countries were monarchies at that time. France was considered a commie because they were <laughs> republican. But France and Russia finally form a fateful alliance around the 1890s on the basis of this common ground, because since Germany was allied to Austria, with Austria-Hungary, uh, it begins to develop this, this mighty bloc situation with Russia and France ally, not because they liked each other, but because they had a common enemy, namely Germany, Austria, and Hungary. Um, and so uh, begins to be, a war situation begins to develop between these two blocs. Great Britain, 
the meantime, becoming very, very anti-German because Germany is rising up industrially and Britain came to, and also had the idea that only Britain can have a large navy. Somehow God had decreed that only Britain can have a navy. So Germany begins to build a navy and Britain's just hysterical. As a matter of fact, Admiral Fisher, the head of the British fleet, wanted to bomb the German fleet in 1907 or 1906, I think. The German fleet was located off Copenhagen in Denmark. And he, wanted, he had a serious plan to bomb it, just like that, to destroy it. <laughs> and uh, it finally overruled. It was called Copenhagening the British, the, the, the German fleet. At any rate, so Britain becomes an ally of, of, of France and Russia. And, uh, and the situation then develops where... Uh, after the, the Serb, uh, a member of the Serbian secret police assassinates the Austrian Archduke in, in, in the, what's now, now known as Yugoslavia, uh, the Austrians wanted, actually what happened was the Austrians wanted to, the Serbs to punish this assassin. The Serbs refused to do it. And a war developed between Austria and Serbia. The Russians come in on the part of uh, Serbia and the French come in uh, on the part of, starting with the Russians, Germans come in on the part of Austria and the British come in. And all of a sudden, bingo, it's war, World War in August 1914. Um, it's a war which is useless from any rational point of view. And no, no rational objective. In other words, there's no, there's no justification, like a moral justification for it, any ground. There's no, there's nobody trying to conquer the world. There's no, none of this stuff. These are imperial, uh, con imperial, uh, uh um, disputes, uh, for ignoble ends. No, for territorial gain. Uh, whatever, for defeating competition by, by, by military fight. And in this fight, there's no question about the fact in my mind that the major culprits are Russia and France and then Britain. So Germany and Austria, Hungary, Germany is the least guilty of all of, of all these of all these states. The one is dragged in because they had a, a peaceful alliance with um, Austria and Hungary. At any rate, both sides think the war will be over in six weeks or so. Quick war will win and by Christmas. The famous phrase was, out of the trenches by Christmas. And uh, what, uh, of course, it wasn't over, so we dragged on for four and a half years, uh, four, four and a quarter years. And as it drags on, as the war gets tougher and tougher, more and more chaos, I mean, the, the war is unbelievably destructive. I mean, by the end of the war, the political systems, the social system, the economic system, the loss of life was enormous. I mean, fantastic loss of life and total disruption of everything. And... Um, and neither side would have a compromised peace. They all say, oh, we have to win, we have to, we have a holy honor to, once, once one soldier of one country gets killed, he said, we have to avenge this guy's death, and goes on and on. It's just an escalating situation. And, uh, there was almost a compromised peace in 1916, and Woodrow Wilson prevented it, one of the most ignoble actions. So, uh, no, no, we have to win. We have to, you know, have to crush them. So, um, in this situation, um, as I say, Morgan was, heavily wrapped up in French and uh, English victory. In addition to that, uh, Kuhn Loeb was pro-German, since Kuhn Loeb, was, the Kuhn Loeb company was a German investment bankers. They sided, you know, was emotionally in favor of Germany, so that the fight, World War I fight then becomes a situation, and Warburg, for example, would squeeze out a federal reserve board because he's pro-German. So we have a situation now where the Morgan can use the World War I, not just to get a lot of profits, but also to crush Kuhn Loeb as a, as a to make it much less effective, like defeating their German, uh, German investment banking co competitors. So at any rate, uh, so there's the, the reason for the war, there's no, there's no good reason for any, for any, anybody's part for the war in any sense. The United States had the least reason possible to enter the war any, at all because, uh, they were trading with both sides. No, no territorial amb ambition, no nothing. So, the, uh, of course, Morgan's trying to get Wilson into the war on the side of the British and French. Huh? And the, the, the big propaganda was a submarine warfare, a terrible thing, and Germans are using submarines. Well, the situation was this. The British were imposing a blockade. Okay? In other words, don't let any goods through. The British were seizing American ships. And there was any American ship which went to Germany was being was seized. The British kept violating uh, American international law and American shipping rights all the time. Um, in other words, we were sending a ship, say, to Germany, the British would confiscate it. And uh, the Germans, however, since the, since the British command of the sea had all the surface ships, the Germans had submarines. The thing is, the submarines can't surface. The thing about submarines, if it surfaces, in other words, if you have a surface ship, let's say you have a destroyer or whatever, and you're a battleship, you can command the ship, you know, heave to and whatever. Uh, 
And uh, you can capture the ship. You can say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take a men on board, etc. But you, you, you can do that. A submarine can't do it. The submarine surfaces and it gives orders that can be destroyed. Submarine, a submarine on the surface is totally vulnerable. There's no weapons. Okay? So the submarine, and what the British would do then, if the submarine tried to get a British merchant ship, the merchant ships were armed, by the way, of course. Uh, if the British if the submarine surfaced and said, go to the merchant ship, immediately destroy the submarine, immediately shoot it. So the submarines had to torpedo the ships. Uh, there's no way that they could, in other words, they, had to, they couldn't surface and give a warning because then they'd be, they'd be smashed. So submarine warfare, since the Germans were forced into submarine warfare because they couldn't have any, didn't have any surface ships worth much, and they were forced into a situation where they had to shoot torpedo, use the torpedo first without surfacing and giving warning. So it was easy to whip up propaganda, emotional propaganda against the Germans in the United States by saying, look, the Germans are terrible. They're, they're, they're not fighting fair because they're submarining. They're using torpedoes. And not surfacing to give warning. And they couldn't give warning. I mean, the whole point is, the whole point of a submarine is it's impossible for them to do it. But actually, the British were interfering much more with American shipping than the Germans were. And if, if we were out to defend the rights of international law and neutrals, etc., we should have gone to war against the British and not against the Germans. This is, uh, I think, a pretty clear cut. <laughs> uh, nobody was advocating, however, going to war on the side of the Germans <laughs> World War I. Uh, so, the, uh, what then also happened was the Lusitania, the famous incident occurred in 1912, no, excuse me, 1916, I'm going to say, 1916 was the Lusitania, which is an armed, British armed merchantman, uh, goes from New York to, um, Mont to London. It was armed, in other words, it was perfectly legitimate for a submarine to, 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 to destroy, to shoot it, to torpedo it in international law, because it was an armed merchantman, it was not a peaceful merchantman. Americans went aboard it. American passengers went in it, even though they knew it was an armed merchant. And it was a very peculiar situation. The British sucked them into it. They said, yes, yes, it's perfectly safe, and so on. They got a lot of big shots, a lot of American big shots uh, on it. Uh, the ship was then sunk by the Germans, torpedoed by a German submarine. It had to try immense hysteria in the United States. We should go to war with Germany. They took American lives were lost. Well, of course they were lost. They were, you get on an armed English merchantman, which is a war with Germany, obviously, you're at risk. Why these jerks didn't realize was something that I, I haven't studied the specific question why they didn't realize. I think they were sucked into it by, by propaganda of the, of the government. Perfectly safe, blah, blah, blah. Now, there is some evidence. This has been disputed. So it's not been accepted yet. There's some evidence of the fact that Winston Churchill was then uh, Secretary of the Navy, equivalent of Secretary of the Navy in England. That was, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty. Deliberately created a situation where misleading the British, the captain of Lusitania, and not telling them that there were German submarines in the area so that it would be sunk. In other words, the British wanted to create an incident uh, which would, where they could use the sinking of a British ship <laughs> with Americans on it to, to, to attack Germany and war propaganda. This has not been fully established. I wouldn't put it past Churchill. At any rate, uh, it's possible that he deliberately did this, not warning, not sending warning of the German submarines in the area, allowing it, so to speak, to be sunk and creating a tremendous war story in the United States. The British, by the way, denied there was an armed merchantman, although, of course, it was. It's another thing. It's another, uh, so, um, and it was the, the submarine warfare question, again, which, which induced, uh, which, which got the climate of opinion such that, United, that Wilson, Wilson declared war against Germany and entered the war to the, to the tune of a huge amount of American lives lost, plus property, plus total destruction of, of of 19th century civilization, really, creation of conditions, we'll see next time, allowing the rise of, bringing about the rise of uh, Nazism and communism. There would not be any Bolshevism in Russia, there would not be any Nazism in Germany, if not for World War I. World War I created the conditions for the whole 20th century stuff. War crusades, perpetual war, all the rest of it. Okay, we'll, we'll take that up Tuesday. Tuesday, I'll start talking about the exam. I think I'm going to have essay questions. It's pretty clear, but anyway, we'll get to talk more about it. Next week, uh, read. Uh, I guess this will be sort of the final reading. Read on the war. It's the final chapter of Weinstein, a magnificent final chapter for the war's fulfillment. Last chapter, chapter of great beauty, and also uh, one of the best chapters in uh, Hughes, chapter 23 on the command economy in World War One. What this is, uh, this presents a so-called revisionist view of World War I uh, on the economic front. And until Weinstein wrote, and Coco has a similar, but Coco doesn't really talk about the war. He stops uh, more or less with the war. 
uh, before this was considered the progressive, progressive uh, era, progressive, progressive reform uh, was, was, was ended by World War I. In other words, he had this great progressive movement and helping the mankind and all the rest of it, and the welfare state and all that. And then all of a sudden war comes along and it's killed progressivism. And what Weinstein points out is that on the contrary, progressive war was the culmination of the progressive movement. It was it. That was the key thing, because it provided all the things they wanted in spades. And they realized that they were all in favor of it, except for one or two people, except for a couple of mavericks who didn't like the idea. Most of the progressives loved the war, and they thought it was the great, greatest thing that ever happened to them, and it happened in the United States. We'll get into that in a minute. <clears throat> and Hughes also talks about the, the war as a command economy. So, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a a very different view of, of, of the progressive movement, namely the status movement, which, which is in favor of any kind of state action, including, especially including war. Similar thing happened with the uh, No Deal period in World War II. It was generally considered that, uh, as Roosevelt said, when, the, when we entered the World War II, the Dr. New Deal is now gone, it's been replaced by Dr. Win the War. So this is, we assume that, that the war put an end to New Dealism. Just quite the contrary, the war was a fulfillment of the New Deal. It maximized state power, which is what the New Deal wanted to do. And it became sort of a permanent heritage of, of, a, of a massive state after that. What's happened in American history is basically that if you, if you want to have sort of a diagram of government power, which is very difficult, I can't really precisely, uh, obviously, measure it. If you want to have a, a, a government power in the, over society and the economy, it's usually pegged along, uh, first at a low level, pegged along until, until a war pops up. In other words, first the War of 1812, Big increase in taxes and government control and all the rest of it, the government budget. Or we spent about 30 years rolling it back, the Jacksonian Democrats, etc. Spent about 30 years getting rid of the effects of World War of, of the War of 1812, excise taxes, federal bank, um, uh, inflationary banking, especially money supply, uh, big increase in the army and uh, in the army and navy and so forth and so on. By the 1840s, these effects were wiped out, and we we kind of lost sort of on a low level. So a civil war, you have a massive increase in government power. The income tax comes in, the draft comes in, uh, huge excise taxes on liquor and tobacco, big increases in the budget, high tariffs, government subsidies, and all the rest of it. Then we take another 30 years trying to wash that out. Never really totally went back, but uh, uh, we never got rid of the protective tariffs and certain cuts. And, and by the way, by the 1840s, get this: by the 1840s, there was no national debt. And Jefferson had paid off the national debt before that. There were almost no tariffs, very, very low. No tariffs. Very low government. Uh, very, no, no income tax either, so there's almost no taxes. Uh, and, no, and, and so then we have a big increase and, and also more free, a free banking system, more or less. Okay. Uh, and then we have a massive you know, government money and so forth. We only partially washed that out by the 1890s. Then comes World War I. You have another tremendous increase in government power, which never gets only reduced a little bit. And World War II, another huge increase, it's only reduced a little bit. So in other words, you have like a ratchet effect. The reason for government, growth of government power in the United States is against the society and the economy is, is, is war. War time is, is basically it. Uh, except for a few, like the progressive period, where there was no war, but a preparation for war, so to speak. Um, it's not the only exception to that. The, uh, the war, as, as, as Randolph Bourne, the great uh, libertarian Writer said around and during World War One, war is the health of the state. In other words, it's war that provides the state the excuse for massive expansion. Um, there's a great new book coming out, which I recommend everybody. It's not, it hasn't been published yet, so I can't require you to read it. It'll come out this summer by Robert Higgs, called uh, Crisis in Leviathan, which deals with how the economy and society have a tremendous increase in government power because of wartime. It's really, it should be a blockbuster. He's one of the very few social scientists, he's an economic historian, one of the very few social scientists uh, who is both free market, both pro-free market and, and anti-war. It's a very small number of people who take that position. Although in the 19th century, everybody in the free market, all the free market people were anti-war. Down to about 1900, 1905. At any rate, um, before I get into the political economy of, the, of World War I, I'm going to uh, finish up on the war. As I mentioned, Last time, the war broke out largely because of Russian imperialism in the Balkans, its, it's, it's pretensions to, to try to run all the Slavs in the Balkans, any, any Slav is considered a Russian 
naturally, naturally born Russian tutelage and France's desire to grab Alsace Lorraine back. Um, and England's desire to crush German, nascent German competition, industrial might and, and navy. As a result, World War I breaks out. Each side thinks they can win very quickly. Um, Wilson apparently stepped in and prevented a negotiated peace in 1916, which would have at least prevented most of the devastation. Wilson, by the way, at this time, itching to get into the war on the side of the Allies because of the Morgan, largely because of the Morgan connection. Also because of Wilson's desire for, for world global salvation through Pius's desire to, to remake the world uh, through, through American might, you know, the typical Pius, he of course was a Piatus, dedicated Piatus type. <clears throat> so um, we have a fusion of Pietism, progressivism, Pietism, and, and, uh, and, world, and this time applied on a world level, not, not just an American level, not just stamp out sin, the American level, also on the world level. Sin was defined by the Wilson as being anything Autocratic. In other words, what he wanted is every country to be democratic in some way, centrist. Neither Marxist nor monarchistic. They're both, both monarchies and, or absolute monarchies, uh, and, and Marxian governments violated his creed, or what Wilson thinks, thinks the world should be, should, should be, thought the world should become. Basically, Wilson, by the way, sets forth all of American foreign policy since then has essentially been Wilsonian, as well as the party. Even the 1920, even the Republicans in the 1920s were basically Wilsonian. Certainly, Secretary of State Hughes, a Rockefeller person, was, was Wilsonian, and, and so was everybody else. When Richard Nixon became president, the first thing he did was to put the picture of Wilson up on the, right over his desk as his inspiration. So they've all been Wilsonians ever since then. And with Wilsonianism meaning the United States has a, some, some kind of God-given mandate to see to it everybody in the world is democratic. There are democracies everywhere, and all the world shapes up according to the United States desires. Um, and uh, so he stepped in, he prevented the negotiated peace in World War I, but at that time his idea was every, every ethnic group should have national self-determination. Now this, of course, is, this was a, a 19th century liberal view, national self-determination, opposition to imperialism. Right? So that each nation, each nationality should have its own school, own languages, own government, so forth and so on. The problem is, this was done through, through coercion, in other words, through American imposition from above, and at Versailles, after the war was over, a tremendous devastation of the war, uh, a, a victor's peace, of course, written by the victors, uh, the, re, the map of Europe was redrawn, allegedly in accordance with the Wilsonian principle of national self-determination. However, and they had these experts, so these historians who were, who were appointed by Colonel House about a year or two before the end of the war, called the Inquiry, a whole bunch of ex political scientists and historians Signing how to carve up the map of Europe. This is a beautiful, this is a beautiful uh, opportunity for intellectuals to take over. Here, they, you know, intellectuals were given for the first and last time, perhaps, the power to redraw the map of Europe, almost, almost at will. And you can't, and they did it. You can't imagine how, how they botched it up. In other words, if they had, they'd been blind, if they'd been played the what do they call this, pin the donkey, pin the donkey game, if they'd taken the map of Europe and arbitrarily, you know, blindfolded themselves and, and arbitrarily picked out. Um, Wait, carving up the map of Europe by purely blindly, they could have done a worse job than they did. It's unbelievable what they did. They, they screw things up to such an extent that they create a perpetual war from then on <clears throat> for the rest of the 20th century. But it was done, it wasn't really random. It was done with a certain amount of malice of forethought. It was done, of course, Colonel House and all the, and the historians essentially in the Morgan ambit. Um, and uh, it was carved up in such a, Europe was carved up in such a way as to benefit, maximum benefit the British and French imperialism. The curious thing is what happened in Europe at that time, in Eastern Europe, <clears throat> which began to set the stage for the rest of the 20th century. So the I think for the first and last time in world history, I can't, at least modern history, okay, a very peculiar situation developed in Eastern Europe. Namely, usually when a war, when a war is, is launched, either one side wins and the other side loses, or both sides win. In other words, both sides are in a stalemate situation. Okay? In other words, either one side wins, or both sides are stalemate. Because of the peculiar situation in Eastern Europe in World War I, both sides lost. Uh, I can't think of another situation where both sides are crushed. What happened, what happened was that, um, right, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is Europe. Uh, here's Germany and here's Russia. And they were the two big, con big combatants, and also Austria and Hungary, of course. So Austria and Hungary were totally demolished. Totally, totally wiped, wiped, wiped up by the Allies, just carved up. Uh, so Germany first crushed Russia. I mean, Russia was, had a massive army, huge army, uh, 
and they, they simply lost. They were, they were smashed. Uh, and as they were smashed, what happened by the, toward the end of the war was that simply, in 1917, they, the soldiers just walked off. They shot their officers and left. They walked home, basically. Mass mutinies on the, on the Russian front. And uh, even though, of course, Russia was solidly behind the war, I mean, they were all in favor of it until they won. This, by the way, is typical of states in general. As long as the country is winning, everybody loves it. As long as we crush Grenada, everybody thinks it's a great thing. <laughs> if, on the other hand, the, the coffins start coming back, the body count goes up, support for the war begins to dwindle. And, and as Russia started losing the war, they all, they all left. So you have a massive mutiny in the, in the, in the Russian front, Eastern Front. So here's Russia losing the war in a massive disaster. Every party refuses to leave, refuses to get out. They all say, no, we're committing, to, we're committing ourselves to the war effort, including the Bolshevik party, which was, which had said from the very beginning, this is an imperialist war and Russia shouldn't engage in it. Bolsheviks are saying the same damn thing. They're saying, no, no, German imperialism, blah, blah, blah. By, by this time, by the way, the United States <clears throat> propaganda machine claimed, I think they really believed it by this time, that Kaiser was out for world domination, was out to conquer the world, therefore any any moment he's going to invade the United States, which <laughs> was physically impossible as well as absurd to begin with, and therefore he should, the Kaiser is the, was the center of all evil. You have to crush the Kaiser at all costs. So all the parties were, were, were backing this disastrous policy, uh, including the Bolshevik party. When Lenin returns from, from exile, which arrives at the famous Finland station in, in Leningrad in early in spring of 19, I think April 17, he says, what is it? What is this nonsense? We should get the hell out and get the hell out of the war. The public wants to get out of the war, and it's the only rational thing. The majority of the Bolshevik party were against them, much less everybody else. He finally had to, by sheer mental force, he had to persuade the, uh, yell at the Bolshevik party to convince them to change their position. So finally, after about two or three months, he was able to do it. The Bolshevik party then became the only party in Russia to say, we've got to leave the war. And the basic reason for, for, for the Bolshevik takeover November 1917, is that their only party said, we got to leave the war, we got to quit. Everybody else, the Social Democrats, the Social Revolutionaries, the Mensheviks, of course, the Prezarists, the Cadets, all these people, the whole group, the whole spectrum from right to left, that were committed to the end of the war effort, throw more resources in the battling the evil Germans. So only Lenin said, we got to get out. <clears throat> uh, that's the basic reason for Lenin's victory. The Bolshevik party was small, but they were the only ones that said, no, we got to get out of the war, and it drew a lot of people to the Bolshevik ranks, and it finally... Able to, able to take over. Uh, the other, the other slogan on part of Lenin is they are the only ones who favor the peasants getting their land back from the, from the landlords. The peasant party, the peasants have a big party, the social revolutionary party, supposedly after peasant interests to get rid of feudal land and serfdom and all the rest of the stress, uh, the, the, the effects of serfdom and the big landlord uh, seizure of peasant land. They were in favor of peasant land. So what happened in the summer of 1917, with growing chaos and the war, losing the war, the peasants started taking over their own land. They were shooting the, shooting the landlords and taking their land back. Uh, and uh, the social revolution said, well, we're in favor of this in principle. We can't, this is too anarchic. We've got to wait for a parliament to be established. Because there wasn't going to be any parliament for several years. So the peasant parties turned against the peasants themselves. Once again, only Lenin. The Bolsheviks were against everybody, against except Lenin. Lenin said, no, no, we should ratify that. The peasants are in great, great shape. They're, 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 <laughs> they're the revolutionary group at this point, violating the principles of Marxism, which is really anti-peasant. I mean, Marxists, Marx himself, of course, thought that the peasants were just rabble, and the really progressive class was the industrial the proletariat, industrial workers. The peasants were reactionaries and should be disposed of anyway. But Lenin, being a, being a, sense, a, a, a keen political entrepreneur, so to speak, I think it override as Marxism. So no, no, we, 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 this is a change. We've got to unite with the peasants. So Lenin was the only person in all of Russia to say the peasants are right, the only leader to say the peasants are right, and, and we've got to get out of the war. Because in those two bases, land and peace, that Lenin was able to take over. It's not that everybody in Russia read that copy call the Communist Manifesto. He was the only one to raise the correct position here. At any rate, when he finally took over, it was a big struggle to get out of the war. Uh, even within the Bolshevik Central Committee, um, Lenin said, we've got to ratify current borders. In other words, get out of the war. Just to say, okay, we, get, we, we conclude peace with the, with the current border. At, the, at that time, the Germans had taken over the Ukraine and white Russia. Uh, and set up, by the way, an autonomous, for the first and only time that like, Ukraine and white Russia have been independent like, in at least many centuries, during this brief period, about six, what is it, about six months, uh, Germany had occupied it. And, and uh, set up or allowed uh, Ukrainian and, and white Russian uh, nationalism to take over. 
So, uh, so Lenin said, no, we've got to conclude a peace. The entire Bolshevik committee almost went a sterile at this point. No, no, we can't do it. We have to crush German imperialism, roll back holy German soil, holy Russian soil, all this stuff. It's supposed to be a bourgeois nationalistic views. Trotsky and, and, and all these got Bukhan. They all said, no, no, we have to continue the war. Instead of that, Lenin just overrode them and concluded with the famous appeasement peace of Brussels Tusk uh, in March 1918. Which Russia, Russia successfully got out of the war and just quit. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, just yeah, at, the, at, the, at the situation where Germany had occupied the Ukraine and, and white Russia. So, Russia, so Russia was out of it. In other words, Russia was been defeated. And then, when the Allies, when the United States, Britain, and France con conducted a massive offensive and defeated Germany in November 1918, the so Germany was defeated. And this meant that the, the both Germany and Russia, the two great powers, the great powers in Eastern Europe, were both defeated, both prostrate, prostrate. So it's a very unusual situation. The two mighty superpowers are both beaten. This left a power vacuum in Eastern Europe, a power vacuum which the Allies, Britain, France, and the United States, then took advantage of, to set up client states or quasi-puppet states in Eastern Europe. The idea was to have these states be the buffer zone to keep down Germany and Russia See, Germany was hated because they were the, they were the enemy. They were defeated. Okay? Russia was hated because the communists got them out of the war. We had two enemy countries, so to speak, Bolshevik Russia and Germany. The idea was to have set up these states in Eastern Europe, which would perform the function of keeping down permanently Germany and Russia and keeping them as, as subjugated countries. Uh, the idea was crazy in the long run. Obviously, these countries didn't have the didn't have the resources to do it. It was just, it was just Totally, totally idiotic. It was a long-run proposition. But that was the idea. You keep down. So they set up in Eastern Europe, uh, one of those independent states of Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania. But basically set up Poland as the client state in Eastern Europe. Uh, making Poland as strong as possible by including within Poland, not just ethnic Poland, which would have been perfectly legitimate, but principle national self-determination. Okay? Allow independent Grand independence, ethnic Poland, which is more or less sort of like this. Warsaw, Ludge area, the Polish heartland. Instead of just giving independence to that, they gave Poland a huge amount of territory, one white Russian and Ukrainian, huge chunks of white Russian and Ukrainian, huge chunks of Lithuania, and huge chunks of Germany, which was, which was sliced off from the German heartland, namely the, the East, East Prussia, Whole area here, huge parts of Prussia and uh, huge Prussia was left. But huge chunks of Prussia, Silesia, big coal and iron area, a Sudeten German Sudetenland German area. So all this was put placed under Poland. Okay, so the, when I was growing up, with the map, the European map of the 1930s, Poland, which we we consider as a kids, well, it's Poland, right? It's natural Poland. It was really only about half of it was Poland. The rest of it was huge chunks of Germany. White Russia and Ukraine, all of whom hated the Poles, of course, for, for good reason at this point. So we had then, <clears throat> Poland was supposed to be the power center keeping down the Russians and the Germans in Eastern Europe. Czechoslovakia was also carved out. I mean, here we had Czechoslovakia. The Czechs were our client state. The Czechs, we love the Czechs. The Masaryk was here in the United States and influencing Wilson, et cetera, et cetera. So we had, uh, uh, we had the Czechs. And the Slovaks were, who hated the Czechs and Slovaks have hated each other's guts for centuries. They just hated each other's guts. Eventually they were placed in one country, with the Czechs dominating the Slovaks. And also the Carpatho Ukrainians, really just Ukrainians. So the whole chunk. So the Czechs were given power over this people. About, about half of Czechoslovakia was Czech. The Slovaks were then dominated, and it was Carpathio Ukrainians dominated by the Czechs. Then Yugoslavia was set up, carved out of Austria Hungary with with uh, the, the Serbs, who were our clients, so to speak. The Serbs dominating the other half of the country, which are Croat, Slovene, Montenegrin, uh, Macedonians, that all of whom hate the Serbs, for good, again, for good reason. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you had the Serbs, about half the population, tyrannizing over the rest of the country. And you have the Czechs tyrannizing. Those are the Czechs, the Czechs and the, Czechs, the Serbs, and the Poles were our favorite states. They were the client states. And they're supposed to keep down Russia and, and Germany. And first of all, they were small anyway. Second of all, they, were, they had a huge amount of 
friction within their own country. Because it's set up, in other words, set up a permanent problem, permanent friction, permanent problem of, of domination and, and uh, resentment among the people being dominated. So instead of granting national self-determination to every group, they were only granted three ethnic groups, and the rest of them were, were put under the domination of the, of the people they hated. It's not exactly a, a, a good long-run setup. <laughs> okay. So um, there's no such thing as, as Yugoslavs. There's no such thing as Czechoslavs. You say, well, this is American, and English, and French propaganda. There are Czechs, there are Slovaks, there are Croats and Serbs, again, who hate each other's guts, so forth and so on. For a while, Russia was, was being crushed. In other words, for a while, the United States, United States, France, uh, and I think um, United States, France, I think Japan all invaded Russia to try to overthrow Bolshevism. Uh, this really sort of cemented Bolshevism. The Russians didn't like being invaded for obvious reasons, <laughs> and <laughs> it's really bolstered Bolshevism rather than uh, overthrowing it. And the Poles invaded Russia and seized a whole bunch of seized this eastern Ukrainian Russian zone here. <clears throat> Uh, so when Russia got, finally got out of it, when, when Trotsky built up the Red Army and finally beat back the Allied forces, obviously there was a lot of hatred <laughs> between the East and West already. So we have, in other words, conditions were beautifully set up for, for another war, for the Second World War, because the, Ger the German foreign policy then became, for the rest of the 20 years, to get back the territory they were, they were carved up out of. In other words, territory was carved up. The, the, the Allies forced the Germans, the, the Allies imposed a, a food blockade. The armistice was, armistice was declared on November 11, 1918. Until the peace treaty was signed the following year, I think September or August or something, the Allies imposed a food blockade. The British and French blockaded Germany. So there was a mass starvation in Germany and Central Europe after the war, for about nine months after the war was over. So that Germany could sign the famous war guilt clause, confessing to total war guilt. They were the only guilty parties in World War I, of course, obviously baloney. I mean, so probably they were the least guilty of any of the states. They had to sign a sole war guilt clause, which sort of rubbed the soles on the wound. Uh, so in other words, Alsace Lorraine was taken away from Germany, the, East, the German areas in Sudetenland were taken away, the po Polish corridor were taken away, uh, and also the colonies in, in Africa. <clears throat> and the German foreign policy, regardless of what party, right, left, or center, the next 20 years was devoted to getting back the country the territories, the rearming, because unilateral disarmament was imposed on Germany also, by the Versailles Treaty, and, and, and they attempt, they, the idea was to get the territory back. Uh, the English for a long time were saying, yes, they're really right, we have, to, we have to adjust this, we have to disarm and give them territory back, and that person never did it. So, and Russia was trying to get their territory back, and it was the goal of Russian foreign policy. Both countries, both Russia and Germany, became revisionist countries in Versailles, Treaty. And the, the idea then was that Russia want to get its territory back and Germany want to get its territory, regardless of what the ideology was, they want to get the territory back. And so the famous Hitler Stalin pact of 1939 should not have been a surprise to anybody. It was a big shock to the leftists in the United States. It, should, it, was, it was very easy to understand because what the Russians did, they got their, their territory back, eastern Poland, which is really part of Russia. They got the Finland, and we got the Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania back, and the Germans got their territory back. Of course, they also added some more, obviously. <laughs> But the point is, they had reached their objectives, and there was a, there was a unity, a common ground there, regardless of the ideological differences. So it set up, so then there was the whole rest of the 20th century, the whole wars were set up because of the Versailles Treaty. Total, total, total flagrant disaster. <clears throat> At any rate, in addition to that, to get to the, back to the economic aspects, all the boring countries, I mean, Russia, I mean, Germany and France, the United States and England, conducted the war in a very different way from which they conducted the war before. Um, before that, first place, the war was not really total. It was really, it was really sort of more gentlemanly. It sort of fought, the armies fought, and you didn't kill civilians. There was a so-called international law that was developed 17th and 18th century. If you have to fight, don't kill civilians. Don't interfere with neutral trade and all the rest of it. The way the war was fought was very different. It was a total war. The civilians were considered fair game. <coughs> and also, each war was run on a collectivist basis. The, the entire economy was collectivized by each, each, each side, by the United States, by England, by France, by Germany. And they all, they all loved it. They came out of the war saying, this is great. We have a collective system. We have cartelized the system now. We have we impose, uh, we have control of all of industry. We impose price control, production control. We impose we force trade association. We have the whole fascist or corporatist system. But now impose them in, in uh, in the name of the war effort, you have to have a war effort. You have to, well, you have, therefore, you have to. No other war was fought that way. All other wars were fought by you tax or you inflate the resources away from the private sector and you just fight the war. 
Now the ideology was, no, no, you have to total control over the economy in order to fight the wars. Of course, baloney, you didn't have to have it. It just has fit in with, of course, the whole ideology of the progressive era, namely the Morgan and the United States of Morgan Rockefeller are too low of drive for state domination, for government cartelization. And they imposed total cartelization in World War I, war, war collectivism. And they loved it. Boy, do they love it. Because they, you finally had government planning, you had intellectuals running the system, historians and economists and technologists and engineers all running everything. Boy, do they love it. Of course, several hundred thousand people were killed, Americans were killed in the war, many millions of Europeans. That, that was an unfortunate byproduct. They loved the war system. Uh, and so, um, from then on, after the war was over, they tried to come back to it. All the guys who were running the war, and they were pretty young for some reason, they were in their 30s, sometimes in their 20s. For the rest of their lives, which went into the current period, they try to restore the war system, have war collectivism. If you can't have a war, have it to fight depression, have it to fight inflation, have, some, have a government planning system, a government business partnership, big government setting, fixing prices, production, and so forth, having trade associations, a businessman, and then unions running the labor force, sort of co corralling a labor force as a partner in this tripartite kind of agreement. So, uh, and, and Mussolini, unfortunately, it's called fascism in the economic sphere. But basically, the, the, the New Deal was very similar. The New Deal was trying to kind of restore the old World War II system to make it permanent. Okay, before we get to the actual setup, uh, I mentioned that uh, there was more export prosperity before the, we entered the war from 1914 to 17, just to give you a few figures on that. Uh, for example, from August 1914, when the war started, until March 17, when we entered the war, um, total war munitions exported from the U.S. to the Britain, Britain and France was 2.2 billion, which is an enormous amount in those days, like equivalent to about 16 billion now. Uh, 700, 700 million dollars worth of explosives, 420 million dollars worth of iron and steel, 485 million dollars of copper manufacturing, meaning Guggenheims, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Forty percent of the ammunition was DuPont. It was here DuPont calls for a war build-up for defense contracts and all that, and, and makes forty percent of the ammunition. <clears throat> also, in addition to that, in 1913 and 14, there was a, re a big recession due to the previous bank credit expansion. Was, unemployment was fairly high. There was many factories and only a 60% capacity. And so the, the war orders that came in from 1914 were very welcome to all these people. Hey, this is great. Boy, I guess this is super. Andrew Carnegie writes a letter to Wilson in November 1914 saying, this is great stuff. We have a very distressing financial and economic conditions. And here are these export orders are really helping us out. And of course, Benjamin Strong, the newly developed Federal Reserve System begins to inflate a lot in order to we'll permit all those things to happen, permit big foreign loans, loans to Britain and France, uh, expansion of, of, of uh, ammunition, of war industries, and so forth and so on. All this is, is rendered permissible by the, by the big expansion of inflationary money supply, money in banking, which of course then doubles the price level by, 19, by the end of World War I. Um, <clears throat> And the profits go up in the war industry. For example, uh, iron and steel exports, for example. Uh, U.S. iron and steel exports were um, $250 million in 1914. And by 1917, when we entered the war, it was $1.1 billion. So it's a four or five fold expansion in iron and steel in, uh, exports. The uh, iron and steel profits went way up as a result. The, uh, the, pro the average profit rate in 1915 we have, iron and steel was 7.5%. Uh, by 1917, it was 29%. So big expansion of profits, uh, even more than the, about, almost about the same as the ex exports. Uh, so, uh, so we had, in other words, enormous increase in profits as a result of the, of the war production and war exports. Right, in addition to the Morgan underwriting of, uh, monopoly underwriting of, German, of British and French bonds, there were also, Morgan loaned $823 million, a stupendous figure in those days, a, a single loan, uh, in late 16, early 17, to Great Britain. So when the war was, when the war came about, there was a massive collectivization of, of the, of industry, was, uh, usually illegally. In most cases, Wilson simply appointed somebody to be the czar of some industry, and it was illegal, and then they got the Congress to, Three months later, to ratify it by passing a law saying this is okay. Um, 
a certain jockeying for power, and eventually by March 1918, Bernard Baruch, as I mentioned, became the, the sole head of the War Industries Board, uh, collectivizing all of industry. And they were set up commodity sections. In other words, each commodity has the commodity sections. There were about, uh, I think, 90 of them? Let me see. Uh, there were over 60, over 60 commodity sections. There were different commodities, iron, steel, copper, whatever, had sections. These, these were called commodity sections. Uh, which were headed by you know, a certain number of people, three or four or five or whatever, government appointees running each section. Let's say, let's say iron and steel. And the iron and steel people would negotiate with trade associations. If they didn't have a trade association, they'd encourage them, they'd sort of force them to have one. Well, you, you guys better form a representative so we can negotiate. So the young iron and steel industry would encourage them to have, to elect representatives, so to speak, and they would negotiate over prices and production with the iron and steel committees, okay, with the government committees, the section, section chiefs. And this would happen in copper and everything, all, you know, machine tools, all sorts of, all, all these industries, a whole bunch of different industries, each of which would have government appointee section chiefs and committees negotiating prices and production with these committees, with the trade associations. The question is, who are these guys in the government? They were big shots in, big shots in the same industry. In other words, they appoint these guys Let's say the head of U.S. Steel would be appointed head of the steel section. He would then negotiate with, his, with the vice president of U.S. Steel, <laughs> or two or three other types. In other words, it's a very cozy cartel arrangement where the government officials are simply the same, the old heads of various firms, and then they get a dollar a year. They say, boy, we're really sacrificing the war after only getting a dollar a year from the government. But they have the power, also they keep getting salaries from, the, from the, an, an escrow or whatever from the, from the industry, from the firm anyway. So, <laughs> And they're negotiating, they're quote, negotiating quote, with, the, with the people from their own, their own buddies from the, from the big shots and, and steel and construction and copper and lumber and whatever. In this way, the whole, go the whole government, the whole industry was planned uh, by, by these government association, collaboration government industry, designed so as to restrict production and keep prices up. I and mean, you can expand war production, but they're restricted in the sense of keeping, making sure the prices go way up <coughs> and profits are guaranteed and so forth and so on. So uh, they all loved it, except for individual firms that try to break the cartel. If an individual firm try to, try to bust the agreement and lower prices or expand production, uh, in other words, they have minimum quotas and, and maximum, pro, uh, maximum, minimum, minimum, uh, minimum prices and maximum production in most cases. Um, if some firm would try to outcompete, they'd immediately be smashed. They'd, they'd, be, they'd be cracked down on by the government. Uh, the mavericks who, who refused to run with the herd, as they call it. The, these were called, by the way, these, these representatives are called war service committees. The industry groups were called war service committees, and the, the government were called commodity sections. There were about 300 or so war service committees, associated with by about 60 or so commodity sections. And the Chamber of Commerce, which was set up by the government, in essence, remember, Taft had the idea toward the end of his regime to set up a, a, a an industrial group which would then sort of negotiate with government. And Wilson, they were just about, they just about came into being by the time Wilson came in. So the Chamber of Commerce sort of oversee this whole thing. In other words, sort of appointed the War Service Committee or got, or got, the, got the copper industry to get together and, and, and elect the War Service Committee people or appoint them. The Chamber of Commerce is sort of acting as a government business liaison through this whole situation, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. <coughs> um, a very cozy situation, for example, Governor Clarkson, who was, I think, the Secretary of the War Industry Board, wrote a book about the experience after the war is over. They all loved this experience. It was just great. And Clarkson will participate in it. It's a very interesting book. I mean, of course, he loved the whole system. He sees nothing wrong with it. He's lauding the whole thing. It's called, I think, uh, Industrial Production in America or something like that in the war. There's a great quote from Clarkson, a revealing quote. He's talking about the war collectivist. Businessmen wholly consecrated the government service. There's a lot of baloney, they're concentrated their own profits to condition the government. So this is not wholly consecrated, consecrated the government service, but full of industry, full of understanding of the problems of industry. Now faced, that, that's the guys on the commodity section. These were businessmen consecrated the government service, wholly conse consecrated the government service, but full of understanding of the problems of industry. Now faced businessmen, wholly representative of industry, that's these guys in the war service committees, their buddies, uh, but sympathetic with the purpose of government. Of course it's sympathetic. Well, it's a very cozy partnership here, cartelizing partnership. 
Then he goes on. The commodity sections were businessmen operating, gov operating government business for the common good. If you scratch the common good, you get the much better view of it. The war committees of industry knew, understood, and, 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 and believed in the commodity chiefs. They were of the same piece. They were the same people. They were buddies or they were close friends and whatever, coming from the same firms and, and, and cozily getting together with a power of government to, to run the system. Again, he says the commodity sections were industry mobilized and drilled and, and mobilized and drilled, responsive, keen, and fully staffed. They were militant, uh, they were militant and in serried ranks. Notice the military analogy here. They were militant, they were, they were all organized. Um, he says at one other point, if, if any maverick tried to undercut the system, try to compete, in other words, he was roped and branded and forced to run with a herd. And they were treated as if they were cattle, you say. Um, if a maverick leaves the herd, he's forced by, by the benevolent shepherd or whatever it is, the, you know, the cattle, the cowboy to come in and force him to, to join with the rest of his group. Uh, the commodity section, he says, were industry, yeah, they were a system of concentration of commerce, industry, and all the powers of government that was without compare among all the other nations. Well, the other nations were pretty, were pretty well acted that way, too. It's, uh, at any rate, um, who was in the War Industries Board? Well, Baruch, as I say, was the chairman. Right? A, a Guggenheim tool, as we now know, after many years of, of uh, mystery. The vice chairman is Alexander Legge, another very interesting person who pops up later. Very important figure of Baruch. All these guys, by the way, have, uh, had a lot of solidarity coming out of the war. They all loved it, and they all liked each other. They all got along very well. And after the war, the next 20 years, they're trying to recapture, reestablish these institutions in peacetime. Alexander Legge, vice chairman of the War Industries Board, was, uh, had been chairman of the board or president or whatever of International Harvester, one of the top Morgan trusts. So in other words, parenthesis Morgan. Uh, he was vice chairman of the War Industries Board. Robert Brookings was in charge of price fixing. He was a wealthy St. Louis lumber magnate and the founder of the Brookings Institution around that time. Another guy who was another became a Baruch tool for the next 20 years and also founder of a farm block was George Peak, was vice president of Deere and Company, later the Moline Cloud Company. And Moline was the Second largest farm equipment manufacturer. Uh, International Harvester is the leading farm equipment manufacturer. Um, so Peak and, and General Johnson, who was, was also in the Deering Company and Marine Park Company later, became the founders of the farm block after the war was over, about 1920, 1919. Peak and Leggy, uh, and Peak and, and Johnson came out with a book called Equality for Agriculture which they call for the use of government to raise, especially the farm price support firm, to buy crops, cotton, wheat, etc., to, to raise the farm prices. Now, these guys were not dirt farmers. They were farm equipment manufacturers. And they realized, of course, if you want to subsidize farm equipment manufacturing, the best thing to do is for the government to subsidize the farmers and in turn will then buy farm equipment. So, uh, and Baruch, by the way, is also the, 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 the grand old man, so to speak, of the farm policy, farm price support program. He was a big land speculator. He bought a lot of rural farmland. Of course, if you have farm price support, so the government tremendously raises the price of farm farmland. So um, there's a personal economic interest involved here, as well as an ideological drive towards statism. Um, then there's a railroad administration in charge of the railroads. As we'll see next time, the railroads are nationalized by the government, the federal government. Uh, at the behest of the railroad, they loved nationalization. You think the government, the railroads wouldn't like to be nationalized. They loved it. Because what happened in World War I, as I think I mentioned uh, last time or the time before that, the railroads had lost control of the ICC. They had set up the ICC. They were running it for many years. By 1900, 1905 or so, the shippers began to control it. The organized shippers, of course, wanted to keep railroad rates low. All of a sudden, the railroad found the railroad rates were low. They didn't like the ICC anymore. And so, the, in order to get out from under the ICC, the railroads promoted the idea that the government should nationalize them. The government nationalized the railroads, took them over. Uh, I think it was set up by the railroad administration, ran the ran the trains and all that, and incurred all the operating costs. And the, and the railroads got a guaranteed profit. In other words, the railroads got their whatever the six percent, eight percent profit or something, but doing nothing. All the costs were incurred by the government, deficits, and then the taxpayer picked up the difference and paid off the railroad. They loved it. It's a great way to be nationalized. You get guaranteed profits and no costs. 
And also Herbert Hoover was in charge of the food administration as the czar of the entire food industry. Hoover had been a uh, British connected miner, uh, and, uh, geologist and, and general copper and, and, and oil miner and so forth. Well, I guess copper mines, but other other uh, mines. Uh, and uh, was in England and it took took charge of Belgian war relief. Uh, for which he became known as a food, food maven. And then he was appointed by Wilson, his big Wilsonian, became the food czar, demanding absolute power of all food. He didn't even have a commission over him. He just, just ran the whole, all of food, and farms, uh, wholesale, retail, everything else. And what he did is he imposed a whole licensing requirement. He had to, in order to exist in the food industry, he had to have a license. A federal license, which was issued by the Food Administration. If they didn't like what you were doing, if you didn't abide by the uh, the price and, and production agreements, you're deprived of your license. You, you put out a business, in other words. A very powerful weapon by Hoover. He's, Hoover was much more of a dictator over food than the other guys were over industry. He has a huge federal licensing network. Uh, also, Hoover, I think, invented the, the, the system of being called fake volunteerism. In other words, what he did was, he had all these, these price and production, say price restriction, price uh, control put on by Hoover. Uh, food prices had to be a certain amount, so forth and so on. It had a certain minimum. Uh, and he got the public to volunteer to, to, to be the enforcer, unpaid enforcer. In other words, he mobilized the public to be like friends of the friends of the of, uh, of, uh, food administration. I think he had some some stamp, some kind of logo of the food that the, had to abide by each each restaurant, each food you know, grocery store had to have this logo of the food administration. And he mobilized everybody to report, to spy on their neighbors, spy on every restaurant, every grocery store, make sure they didn't cut prices or whatever. If they did cut prices, they report them to the Food Administration. So there's like a vast espionage network of unpaid patriots who were spying on the opposed Food Administration regulations. Uh, that's, what, that's what Hoover called volunteerism. The peculiar kind of volunteer is like having voluntary, uh, you know, voluntary Gestapo <laughs> spying your neighbors. And the regulations that he put in were cartelizing regulations. In other words, for example, he had a big bread campaign of force before that. If the wholesalers or bakers sold bread to the retailers, and, and, and retailers didn't sell all the bread, they returned them to the uh, free of charge, like newspapers, newsstands now return unsold papers uh, to the uh, to the, to the newspaper, news dealers, newspaper people, so they could return the bread and get paid for it. So Hoover insisted, put the government regulation, no, no, from now on, they, they, the retailers are responsible for unsold bread, and it was trying to get them to sell the stale bread to the public in the name of the war effort. Of course, what it does is it means you're it's restricting the supply, decreasing the quality. Uh, typical cartelizer thing is cut the quality and raise the price. Uh, so these were some of the, uh, the measures. Uh, again, Clarkson, talking about this whole system, says another quote, great quote from Clarkson. Business willed its own domination, forged its bonds, and policed its own subjects. There, was, there, was bitter and there were bitter and stormy protests here and there. The occasional obstructor fled from the mandate of the board, only to f find himself ostracized by his fellows in industry. In other words, anybody who broke decided to sell, you know, sell, sell fresh bread instead of stale bread or cut the price or whatever was then ostracized by the, by the other people in the industry as, as violating the cartel agreement. And also, of course, in, in the case of Hoover, mobilizing the public, mis the deluded public to, to, to uh, spy on and, and try to put, out, put these guys out of business. Another thing that the Food Administration did, and also was done in industry, in the name of the war effort, is to eliminate a varieties of products. This was done all through industry, by the way. Uh, compulsory is called an elimination of waste. Therefore, you're against waste. Waste is bad for the war effort. So the, in the name of eliminating waste, they had compulsory standardization of all sorts of stuff. Gear shifts, bread, I mean, whatever, whatever you think of. In other words, if there were 50 different, 50 different varieties of certain products, they made, they fortunately to have only 10, things like that. By doing that means you're eliminating small businesses, you're, you're, you're hurting, you're changing the shape of industry to have, to reduce the number of, of, of opportunities available to the consumer. You're, ha you're, you're having a smaller number of products uh, and, and then a larger size for each product. In other words, you're benefiting large businesses, the expense of smaller businesses which meet different parts of the market. And this was carried on, this was continued during the 1920s by Hoover when he was Secretary of Commerce, continuing this compulsory standardization of industry. So to reduce the number of styles, the number of fashions, the number of uh, different grades of things, and, then they, and thereby cut competition, cut the supply curve to the left, 
pushes 9/11 out, you know, push out of business a whole bunch of competing firms, especially <clears throat> especially small business. Uh, this was done mostly by the Conservation Division of the War Industry Board, called the, conserv the name of conservation. As Clarkson says about the Conservation Division, he says uh, he says a drastic reduction in the number of styles and sizes of products. You can only have like, eight, eight kinds of gear shift of years instead of 20 or whatever. Uh, and he said, quote, the World War was a wonderful school. <clears throat> the Conservation Division alone showed that merely to strip from trade and industry the lumber of futile custom and the, and the incrustation of useless variety could then bring about all sorts of great things. In other words, to eliminate what the consumers wanted, which is a lot of variety. Um, for example, there were Conservation Division outlawed 250 kinds of plows and 750 kinds of drills. Well, lots of different drills for different meeting, different tastes. Now, now I can only have a few kinds of plows and a few kinds of drills. Uh, and, and, and Clarkson goes on, this would be, this then would be the goal of the next quarter of the 20th century, to standardize American industry, to make a wartime necessity a matter of peacetime advantage. <clears throat> it was to perpetuate this stuff uh, during peace. Uh, and then, he, then Clarkson talks about how the people of the war industry boards wanted to perpetuate this whole thing forever. He said, uh, he says, uh, from their meditations arose dreams of an ordered economic world. They conceive of America as commodity sectioned, permanently commodity sectioned, for the control of world trade. It beheld the whole trade of the world carefully computed and registered in Washington. In a word, a national mind and will <laughs> Confronting international trade and keeping its own house in business or business-like order. Uh, as Harry Wheeler, who was head of the Chamber of Commerce, talked about the future based on this War Industry Board thing, he said, the War Services Committee system, quote, promises to form the basis for a truly national organization of industry. The integration of business, the expressed aim of the National Chamber, is in sight. War is a stern teacher. War is a stern teacher that is driving home the lesson of cooperative effort. War breaks out, uh, there's tremendous, the European countries are blockading each other, and so not buying each other's food as they used to, and so they're buying the American food, America was neutral in the war until 1918, 1917, so you have a tremendous increase in price, quantity, you have a tremendous increase in demand for American agricultural products, and so, uh, as a result, you have a huge increase in supply, big increase in price. So the price goes up, and then when the war starts, there's a big American demand for food, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and foreign aid, and all the rest of it. You have a tremendous increase in agriculture, both in, in production and in price. Okay? So you have a huge increase in demand, huge increase in price, and it stimulates a big increase in American cotton and wheat and all that. When the war is over, you know, the blockade is gone finally, and Europeans are growing their own food and trading it. They don't need American agriculture that much. The demand curve for, uh, for agriculture falls back again and prices fall. And after every big war, you have, always have a fall in farm prices. First, the prices go up during the war. Same thing happened after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. Big drop in the demand for agriculture, big fall in prices. Well, if there's full agricultural prices, the farmers start griping, of course. Farmers want to be kept in a stock to which they become accustomed during wartime. And but the, the farmers themselves were not that organized yet. The farmers were not, uh, had not, didn't have a powerful farm block that they have today. The first guys calling for government subsidy to agriculture, farm price support, in other words, the, government, the taxpayer buying farm products that can rise in price, was Johnson and Peake and Baruch as their godfather, so to speak. Baruch, I guess, was the, was the, the Jewish godfather of this whole movement, so to speak. Uh, so Johnson and Peake write this thing. So he, the worst, farm equipment manufacturers saw from the very beginning the advantage of the farm price support, in other words, to that. In other words, if you give the farmers more money, they will buy more farm equipment. And so, the farm equipment manufacturers are the first ones to call for farm price supports. Baruch himself was a farm speculator. One, he was engaged in mining, of course, which was also farm land. Also, he bought a lot of real estate speculation, and then when farm prices were supported, his, his land went way up. So we have a combination of farm speculators and farm equipment manufacturers uh, being the first ones to, to engage in this farm block process. So um, they, uh, they started this as agitation for farm, farm price supports. And all the, way, all the way in the 1920s, this picks up support among the farm, you know, organized farmers and they get into it. And Herbert Hoover was also a Baruch, I mean, also part of the Wilsonian war effort. Uh, 
In other words, he was a, nominally a Republican, but nobody even knew it. He was, he was the food czar in World War I, as I already mentioned. And uh, also a big pro-farmer person. He told the uh, farmers that if he ever got to be president, he would immediately institute this, farm, this new system of farm price supports, which he did. The first thing he did as president. He gets in in March 1929, immediately pushes through his farm price pro program, which of course is still with us. It's still a big disaster. It's gotten worse, but I mean, basically he started it. Hoover basically was a major person responsible. So, uh, <clears throat> again, bipartisan. Hoover, when Hoover entered politics, Hoover had been in, in Bell, he was a big, geolog big, big mining geologist, is what he was, basically, and an entrepreneur and promoter of, of copper mines and other mines throughout the world. He lived in London for many years, uh, and uh, during World War I, he was head of Belgian War Relief which was using food as a political weapon uh, to, to feed only Belgians and not Germans, that sort of stuff. I don't know, pretense of being a Christian pro-food person who doesn't care what, who's, who's being relieved. At any rate, uh, when, the, when, we, when America entered the war, Hoover was made food czar. It was brought back by Wilson. Wilson loved Hoover, and Hoover loved Wilson. I mean, Hoover was a Wilsonian to the, to the hilt. And, uh, and his career, his political career begins. He's already a multimillionaire. He wants to devote himself to politics. He's only about 40, something like that. And he becomes uh, the, head, the food czar. He insisted, by the way, Baruch at least had the, the head of the War Industries board. Right? Hoover insisted, I, I want no, I, no boards. I've got to be the sole power. And Wilson, of course, gave it to him. Like Wilson made Colonel House his foreign policy czar, so to speak. Yeah, Colonel House, a Morgan associate. Uh, Hoover said, I have to be the food czar. So Hoover heads up the food administrator. He's a food administrator. And use that thing Sam mentioned as the licensing power to license everything connected with food. In other words, the federal government licensed every restaurant, every food, uh, wholesale, or manufacturer, everything. Farmers, everything was, well, any processor was licensed. And if, if the, if the, uh, the restaurant or the, or the bread manufacturer or whatever didn't obey the food administration regulations, the cartel regulations, that you have to, price has to be a certain amount, production has to be a certain amount, they didn't obey it, they were, the license was taken away, they couldn't, they were put out of business. It's a very powerful, Licensing is a very powerful weapon. It's like the FCC can decide a radio station or a TV station is un biased or something, and they can remove the license. So, uh, Hoover also pioneered in the use of, of phony volunteerism. In other words, to use the masses, use the public, unpaid supporters of the unpaid enforcers of government regulations. So, uh, he'd say, well, uh, if, if every restaurant had to obey certain price regulations. Uh, maximum prices, minimum prices, whatever. And uh, if the, uh, and they had to put up a sign saying, we obey the regulations, some kind of symbol, which, which Franklin Roosevelt later used for the N N National Recovery Administration called the, uh, the Blue Eagle, the NRA, a Blue Eagle sign. Put your Blue Eagle up on the window to say, show you're a true American. So at any rate, uh, then they used the masses to, to enforce it. In other words, the Hoover encouraged volunteer organizations of citizens to go out there and police the food stores and the, and the restaurants to make sure that prices were no higher or no lower uh, than, the, than the regulation. Okay, so this is a, and then to report back to the local government food administrator. So in other words, they use the, the public as a group of un, unpaid spies, so to speak. This was done also in civil, on the civil liberties front. Uh, the public is encouraged to turn in, quote, German agents or German spies, unquote. This is the beginning of the whole spy hysteria, which of course is still with us. World War One. I, I mean, starts everything. World War One begins the whole business. The whole espionage hysteria starts then. Uh, and uh, everybody, not only a lot, of, not only is this the beginning of the FBI, and uh, more, it really starts slightly after the war, but basically begins then. But the whole idea that, that, that we're talking menace from foreign agents begins in this period, and, and people were encouraged to turn everybody in. Everybody, anybody who's speaking German was, was, was in those days a fair game. As a matter of fact, the use of the German language was the use of the German language, the teaching of German was outlawed in Seattle. That's one of the high points, low points, World War I. So German was considered an enemy language, therefore nobody was allowed to teach it. It's a great, great step forward in human knowledge. <laughs> Bunch of monsters. Anyway, this is the, and so German cannot be taught in the public school system because, uh, because it was a so-called enemy language. <laughs> and um, sauerkraut was, ne was renamed Liberty Liberty Cabbage, I think, or Victory Cabbage, yeah, which was sauerkraut is a red German name. Beethoven was barred from being on the radio because uh, he was a German composer, right? 
And uh, so I mean, it's just unbelievably monstrous. The whole, the whole set, the whole World War One. I mean, just it, it begins all the evils of the 20th century. I mean, it's not a good sense. The whole, whole man does it economically, the foreign policy, and civil liberties, and all the rest of it. And those those historians. It also begins the idea of intellectuals working for the war effort, working for the government uh, to 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 uh, run the run the run the system. Economists to run the economy. Uh, historians to propagandize why the Germans have been evil since the 16th century or whatever, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and social workers and all the rest of it, the whole, the whole group, political scientists, all of them become part of the, of the, of the government machine, in this case the war machine. Uh, particularly the, those intellectuals who have gotten PhDs in Germany, historians, economists, political scientists, are leading the parade and saying old German culture has been evil since uh, for hundreds of years. I mean, it's, it's just a, Writing crazed pamphlets <laughs> that it all started with Luther and everybody's been evil ever since. The old Germans have been rotten and so forth and so on. Of course, they set up, sang a very different tune, you know, five years before that. <clears throat> but this is the, they, each one was trying to prove their 100% Americanism or 200% Americanism, whatever. Any professors who didn't, don't go along with this were driven out of the university system. And Richard T. Ely, one of my least favorite people in American history, he's like, to me, symbolizes much of this, was a, uh, the top progressive economist, founder of the major founder of the American Economic Association, to, to, to lead the economic profession away from laissez-faire and toward the statism, <clears throat> uh, head of the founder of the Wisconsin idea, um, and institutionalist and uh, whatever, got a PhD in German in Berlin, uh, was one of the leading war propagandists and cracking down the idea of any anybody uh, you know, any academic freedom for professors and all the rest of it. Um, <laughs> He also considered any, any pro-peace agitation, any anti-war agitation as, as German espionage, agents of the Kaiser. <laughs> By the way, when Lenin popped up, and Lenin first, uh, as a matter of fact, there are still uh, nutty historians right now who think that Lenin was essentially a German agent. In other words, that all of Bolshevism was, was, a, was a plot by the Kaiser <laughs> to subvert the, the Russian war effort. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the, the still, the still, there was a biography of Lenin a few years ago that said, that said the same thing. It was just a, all essentially a plot, Heiser plot. Um, so, um, so all these guys were, as I say, they, they all started as Wilsonian. Wilson provided the, the sort of the, the intellectual, Wilson himself, as a, the only PhD who's ever been president, and I hope there will not be, not be any other one. <laughs> He's, he's representative of what happens when a PhD becomes president. You know, a professor, PhD, distinguished historian and, and, and political scientist. And, um, and he sets, of course, the idea that, that the, it's America's role in the world is to remake the entire world and the American image. So every, everybody's democratic and everybody's this, that, and the other thing. Centrist and not too, not too left wing, not too right wing. Everything's got to be fixed. And redrawing a map of Europe. Uh, in, in that in that image, um, so Hoover. Nobody knew which which party Hoover belonged to. As a matter of fact, when, in 1920, when Hoover, when Wilson's not only second term was up, he was, uh, he was already pretty ill. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of Democrats, were booming Hoover for, Democrat, for the Democratic nomination for president. They didn't know what his party was. They assumed he must be a great guy, must be a Democrat. Uh, he, he later said he was a Republican, but the point is. It, it, it would have surprised nobody which party he belonged to. The same thing happened to Eisenhower after World War II. Nope. He was being boomed for both party nominations. Uh, and so, because uh, it really didn't, didn't make that much difference. He was, this is a new 20th century bipartisan man, so to speak, who can swing either way because they're really technocrats. Since both parties are, quote, progressive, unquote, both parties are committed to the same kind of a Wilsonian foreign policy and progressive domestic policy, it doesn't really make much difference what party you're dealing with. Oh, another person, another politician who gets his start under Wilson as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Remember, Assistant Secretary of those days was a pretty powerful post. He was like number two man. It was Franklin D. Roosevelt. And of course, uh, later becomes, then runs for Vice President, I think, in 1920, and is defeated, and then, and then of course, becomes President. He also is Wilson. As a matter of fact, Franklin, Roosevelt and Hoover, even though most historians would consider them as Mortal enemies. They really, they were pretty friendly. They were close friends. They're both Wilsonians. They both knew each other. And after the war was over, Wilson and a little-known uh, event, Hoover and Wilson, oh, excuse me, Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt collaborated in a group, formed a group called the American Construction Council. 
and the object of which was to cartelize the construction industry. In other words, the construction industry has always been highly competitive. There's always been a lot of real contractors and developers. The idea was to bring them all together in one council so they can restrict production, raise prices, and all the rest of it. Uh, the usual cartelist thing. It didn't work in the construction industry. It was not, since it did not, did not have government backing, it didn't work. I mean, voluntary cartels never work, and especially didn't work in this case. So it died out after about two or three years. But these two guys, they were the president. One was president and one was vice president. I forget which is which. So Roosevelt and Hoover are both Wilsonians, both um, progressives, both what would later be known as New Dealers. As a matter of fact, the entire New Deal policy started with Hoover. The, 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 well, the entire New Deal program of uh, keeping up wage rates um, by government coercion, uh, expanding, cheapening credit, expanding the money supply, using expanding public works to try to counter the, the, the recession. This all begins with, with Hoover. Just the Roosevelt did the farm price support program. It all begins with Hoover. Roosevelt, Roosevelt just did more of it. Quantitatively, did more of it. But qualitatively, in other words, looking at each program, Hoover really started the whole thing. There's no, there's no program that Roosevelt started. Hoover didn't start before that. Uh, deficit spending, it all really begins with Hoover. Um, the, uh, another thing which I must have almost forgot to, to mention here, another key thing which happened in 1913, in addition to the Federal Reserve Act, which paved the way for financing the war, was of course the income tax, our beloved income tax, which begins with the, begins in 1913 with the Wilson administration, but it was made constitutional under, under the Taft administration in 1908, so that basically both parties again are responsible for this, um, income tax. Uh, before that, of course, there was no income tax. We didn't have to fill out any 1040 forms on April the 15th or anything like that. There, was, there were tariffs. When the Democrats came in, the tariffs were pretty low. And that was about it. Uh, in other words, government was very small because they didn't have an income tax to siphon things off. When the income tax first came in, um, the critics of the income tax claimed that the, you, if you start with this income tax, you might eventually get a, a tax rate as high as 10%. And they said, it's crazy. Of course, it's not about the 10%. 1%, 2%, maximum, 5 the highest millionaire level. <laughs> the rest, of course, is history. Uh, so, again, with any, as with any government power, especially revenue source, uh, revenue gathering source, you start small and you keep expanding. This is, of course, what always happens with government. You start small, get your foot on the door, and <laughs> you get people desensitized to it, and you widen it and grab more loot. Uh, you don't start with a 90% income tax right away, obviously. It'd be a revolution. You start with five and work your way up. <laughs> so anyway, of course, now it's part of the American heritage. Um, the, uh, actually, the income tax wasn't used that much until World War II. What happened in World War II was, to finance World War II, see, the old days, you had to, you had to cough up your entire lump sum on, on, on March the 15th. You had to save up. You had to pay $5,000 in income tax. You had to save the whole thing up and pay it in one sum. And obviously, nobody could, you know, very few people could do that. So the tax rates had to be kept fairly low. 